Thank you all for being here this evening. My name is Emily Yetman. I'm, oh, thank you. Uh, I'm executive director of Living Streets Alliance, and uh, I have the honor of introducing Gil tonight, and it's, it's hard to even know what to say when someone like this comes to town, because I remember uh, in 2010 when we had our first Ciclovia event, and we closed the streets um, for one day, and 5,000 people came out, and, and we saw this, right? We saw this, and there was this moment where we realized, oh my gosh, people are ready for this. Tucson is ready for this, and we want this. And so it's, it's really exciting. Um, you know, we've got our 14th Ciclovia coming up, um, so it feels really um, exciting to be able to bring Gil here today on, on, on the... Uh, I guess it's not the eve, but the eve of the eve of the eve, right? So thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to read a quick introduction to Gil, not that you need one. I'm sure you all did your homework, and um, you've been following him for years, as we have. But in case you haven't, Gil is passionate about cities for all okay. people. He advises decision makers and communities on how to create on vibrant line. cities and healthy communities for everyone, regardless of age and social, economic, or ethnic background. He's the founder and chair of the internationally recognized Canadian nonprofit called 8 to 80 Cities, and he's also chair of World Urban Parks. Um, and he's gonna talk about a lot of that, and uh, then I get to, to wrap it all up. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Gil, and let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. How nice. Look at that little girl. Fantastic. So to, tonight, we're going to be talking about sustainable mobility. Also, we're going to talk about parks and cities and communities. And keep in mind, some cities that I'm going to talk about are bigger than Tucson. Some are smaller. Some are wealthier, some are poorer. But it doesn't matter. When we talk, there might be cities of 10,000 people or cities of 10 million. The issues are the same. You need public transit in the city of 10,000. Maybe you're going to have three or four buses. You need public transit in the city of 10 million. Maybe you need a tram or two. We're living longer in the city of 10,000 and we're living longer in the other. So the issues are similar. So let's keep our mind open to those. Also, in the, in the small city, we got climate change. And in the large one, we also are being affected by climate change. Even if some people, <laughs> maybe they're going to start believing. We got population growth everywhere. And most of it is urban. In the US, 9 out of 10 people live in urban in, in cities. We are going through a public health crisis, physical, mental, emotional. We're living longer. Not longer, much, much longer. Look at this. This is the life expectancy. All of these are the countries in the world. 200 years ago, there was not a single country with a life expectancy above 45. None. So many of us would be dead by now. <laughs> Today, there is not a single country with a life expectancy below 45. It's amazing what has happened in the last 200 years. So that plus the public health crisis and climate change and so on means that we are facing an urgency. We need to decide how do we want to live. I was just chatting with a wonderful principal of an elementary school. If we want our children to walk to school, we got to have small schools so that the catchment area is small. So we need to decide how do we want to live. And when I talk about sustainable mobility, I'm thinking about walking, riding bicycles, Use of public transit, new uses of cars. By the way, walking and cycling is not a joke. In some places, people treat it as a joke. Sometimes you go to politicians, they say, oh, yeah, you know, that's nice. No, no, it's not nice. You know, this could be any street in Tucson. And then people say, oh, Gil, but here is warm. I, even I went for a run this afternoon, and people said, oh, are you crazy? Did you go for a run? How Weather is always an issue because it's too cold, because it's too hot, because it's too rainy. Maybe we should learn that there is no such thing as bad weather. <laughs> it's bad clothing. <laughs> <laughs> you 
You know, this morning I, I had a meeting with a, a few of the decision makers of the city. Fantastic, really good people. They were really on. But for example, a lot of them were wearing ties, the men. I said, look, if you love ties, that's fine. But it should not be expected. If women were to wear high heels, that's fine. But it should not be expected. I mean, God was so generous with you, with the weather. If, I'm sure that if you are wearing those huge high heels or wearing a tie, you're not going to be having lunch too far from your office. Or else you're going to be driving. If we want people to walk and bike and use public transit. But let me get back. Walking and cycling is not a frivolity. Walking and cycling is the only individual mode of mobility for most people. It's the only individual mode of mobility for all children and youth around the world. You might be the son or the daughter of the wealthiest person in Tucson. If you are under 16, your only individual mode of mobility is to walk or to bike. So it should be safe and enjoyable, almost like a human right. Unless you think that only those that have the money and the age and the desire to drive a car have a right to individual mobility. That's why we're also talking about democracy and human rights and equality and sustainability because everything is really linked to everything. So in addition to sustainable mobility, tonight I'm also going to talk about parks and public spaces. And let's open our mind. You know, a few months ago I was working in Poland and I saw these sculptures and they maybe thought that these people were getting cold and then they lent them the scarf. <laughs> <laughs> public spaces are kind of magical. All of a sudden you see these little people pushing the ball and then the children see this and they're helping them out. <laughs> Public spaces are great. You know, Detroit is being revitalized, and they're working on public spaces in the downtown. Sometimes it's in the middle of the city, like Piedmont in Atlanta. Sometimes it's elevated, like New York, or along the river in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And the things we do in public spaces, so let's open our minds. In the last World Cup of soccer, I was working in Chicago, and I would go see the games in the parks. And that's what they were doing in South Korea, and in Bogota, and in Germany. But again, public spaces is not just about sport. The umbrella revolution in Hong Kong, where do people go? People go to the public places. Occupy Wall Street, people go to the public spaces, to the parks. Jesuit Charlene, Paris. The great thing about public spaces is that are fantastic equalizers. Here no one cares about the ethnicity or if it's old or young or fat or skinny. Everybody's great. It's a great equalizer. But it's not just politics. You go to Rio, two million people in Rio. It wasn't during the World Cup. It was a few months before. The Pope came and gave a mass for two million people. But it doesn't have to be big. Sometimes we're in a small neighborhood. We got a stairs, and it totally transformed. <laughs> this guy is watching to make sure that everybody's paying attention. Imagine from the point of view of citizen engagement that you get a stairs, and you get 130 steps, and you get a... 130 different families, each one painting one step and putting their initials, the level of commitment, of sense of belonging. So that's why when people say, Gil, what's a good city? I said, a good city, a good definition is where I want to sleep at home, but I want to live outside. That's what we need here in Tucson. We want to be able to want to sleep at home and live outside. That's why I'm so happy that the Living Streets Alliance invited me and that you got great partners at the university, at the city. And don't even put it on your calendar, just in your brain. This Sunday, the 8th, 10 to 3, make sure you go. <laughs> and bring all your friends and family and everybody. So I'm going to be talking today about streets and cities. And I'm going to make emphasis on vibrant cities and healthy communities. I'm going to make some emphasis on equity and public health. But to put things into context, I'm going to talk a little bit about Bogota and 880 cities, and I'm going to end with eight messages in Tucson. Bogota, obviously, is not the ideal city. But in my previous life, I've been living in Canada now for about 19 years. In my previous life, I lived in Bogota, and I was commissioner. And I learned that to change cities is not about the money because we always say, oh, we don't have the money. No. And then you go around and they're widening roads or they're doing bridges. 
Also, I've been doing, so I, now I advise many cities, but I've been doing, so I know that it's not easy. For example, in one term, we, did over, we built over 200 parks from scratch, small ones, big ones. This was one of them. The Pope came here, gave a mass for a million people, and then the Pope left, and almost nothing happened. There were not even sidewalks for 27 years. Why nothing happened in 27 years? Because change is hard everywhere. Change is hard in Tucson. Change is hard in Copenhagen, in Bogota, in New York, everywhere. Because you try to change here in Tucson, and the cave people show up. <laughs> you know them, the cave, the, city, the citizens against virtually everything. <laughs> but that's why each one of you has to become a champion at finding solutions to the problems. It's not about having, it's getting things done, not having 20 re excuses why things cannot be done. Don't take no for an answer. It's so easy to take no for an answer. So it was like this for 27, 30 years, and in four years we turned it into a fantastic park for passive, for active, for contemplative. And Bogota is a city that is much poorer than Tucson. So it's about getting things done. Some activities that people do at their own pace and time, it's not just about soccer fields, it's also doing contemplative, that people go and see the birds and the plants, other activities that people can do at their, with others, others by themselves. The uses and the activities, and I'm going to talk about uses and activities a little bit more later on because it's so critical. It's really, really important. That also, the cyclovia. What is the Ciclovia? I found a small program of just a few miles and a few people, and we turned it into the world's largest pop-up park. Sunday mornings, we pop it up, and people come out. Everybody. How do we do it? It's really hard for the Living Cities Streets Alliance to say that it's easy. No, it's not easy. But it's simple. Not easy. Simple. You open streets to people, and you close them to cars, and the magic happens. You get everybody coming out to walk, to bike, to skate. I wanted to make sure that we connected all of the income levels. So all of these colors are the different income levels. So that's why we went just from very small, very few people, to over 75 miles interconnecting everybody. Also some of the main parks so that people can use the streets also to go to the parks. And then you get people all ages, young and old and rich and poor. Imagine 75 miles, every, but not everybody wants to walk or bike or skate, so along the road, some people do aerobics, others do tai chi or cha-cha-cha, <laughs> anything, but it's about physical activity. The common denominator is physical activity, and it's so, also something that is so great. Who comes? Everybody. All you really need is two feet and a heartbeat, and you're going to be there. And it's, that's why it's great. Young, old, rich, poor, fat, skinny. We get 1.7 million people every Sunday of the year. And every holiday. So it's about 65 days of the year. Who pays for it? The city. Of course. It's good for everybody. And that's what I was telling also the decision makers this morning, the city manager and the, and the other commissioners and the directors. Why? Because this is good for everybody. This is not just about recreation. This changes minds. All of a sudden, we realize that the streets, they belong to all of us. The streets, they are public space. And they can have different uses according to the time of the day, the day of the week, the week of the year. And it's not just about recreation. It's about the environment. All of a sudden, we measure the level of the noise at 10 a.m. on a Sunday, same place, 10 a.m. on Monday. We measure the quality of the air. It's good for health. It's good for physical health. It's good for mental health. People could walk around the neighborhood. Why do they go to the cyclovia? Because they want to be with others. They want to be with socials. You know, the thing that people enjoy the most is being with others. That's why cyclovia in Tucson is so important. That's why the government should fund it and say, okay, now for the next 12 months, we're going to do it monthly. We're going to do it the first Sunday of every month. Write to your elected officials. I mean, this, this is a time where citizens can no longer be spectators. You need to participate. You need to be engaged. You got to tell them, you know, this, what's the risk? They are not building gymnasiums or arenas or community centers. So say, let's do it for a year, every, the first Sunday of every month. After a year, 
If no one is going, okay, then you don't do it anymore. What's the risk? Nothing. But if a lot of people are going, then you say, okay, now it's not going to be once a month, but it's going to be every Sunday of the year. So tell them about it. You know, the best cyclovia programs in the world are almost fully funded by the government. Paris, New York, Bogota, Mexico, Guadalajara, and so on. This is like a positive virus. Who would have thought? Yesterday I was working in Los Angeles, the city of angels and cars. They got the ciclavia. And we're working with Mayor Eric Garcetti. Is LA any better than Tucson? <laughs> Tell your mayor. Mayor Eric Garcetti, it was just a few days a year, like here. And now it's every month. But he wants to do it every week. And Portland. And, you know, it works in cities of 10,000 people, of 100,000. So not only Tucson, the communities around also should be doing one. Because it, it works in cities of any size. It's really transformative. It's also about social integration, different ethnicities and backgrounds. For example, we're doing a lot of work in South Africa, in Cape Town and Johannesburg. Five years ago, in India, they didn't have any. Now there's more than 100 in India. Different activities, but everything around physical activity. It might be dancing, it might be yoga. Paris. Paris is cold in the winter, it's very hot in the summer, and they do it 52 weeks of the year in Paris, all the time. It's really fantastic. So if Paris, Paris does it, why not Tucson? So when they tell you, oh, no, it's those Latins, because the Latins are a little crazy. They say, it's not just, <laughs> it's not just the Latins, it's also the French. <laughs> so I, I, I really think that the people of the Living Streets Alliance and everybody that works with Cyclovia in Tucson deserve a big round of applause. <laughs> Emily and team, thank you. Look at this. Wow. Fantastic. You know, the kids, children, since you are a little kid, one of the things that are scare, mo most scary is when you go on a street and they say, watch out, a car, and the kids fall, you jump, astonished. It's like, it's like if there was a wolf or something. It's the modern-day wolf, the cars. <laughs> and now they have the streets for, the, for themselves. It's kind of magical. It's, it's so great. They can paint and do games you know, this is, this is really lovely. Well, actually, he has two kids on the bike, or she? He? You know, this, I love this, these kind of chairs, because most of the people bring their kids on the back. On the back is horrible. Can you imagine you being a little kid, and all you see is the back of your father or the back of your mom, <laughs> and just bumping your nose? And <laughs> <laughs> you don't see a lot of happy kids there. Instead, when you have them on the front of you, it's magical. You develop that bonding and you are talking to each other. You are riding your bike. And just, oh, look at that bird and look at the tree and the store and whatever. You develop. And also the, the child can see everything. I love this. this. Good, good parents. And, oh, I don't know. She, there's something that she didn't like. <laughs> you know, we, volunteers. Also, this, this requires a lot of people. And it's so fantastic. Oh, it's, it's really amazing. The more that I see all of these images, and you know, people that are on wheelchairs or people that are blind or have some kind of disability, all of a sudden, there are no cars, and also, it's, it's kind of magical. And this is great because we meet each other as equals. You know, my inspiration of Ciclovia was Central Park. When I became commissioner, I was reading the biography of Frederick Olmsted. Olmsted designed some of the best parks in North America. Not only Central Park, but also all over the place. Uh, and in Canada, Mongoyal and others. And he said, 160 years ago, he said in New York, everybody hated everybody. The locals and the immigrants, the blacks and the white, the rich and the poor. And he said, they don't know each other. They don't live in the same building. Their kids don't go to the same school. We need to find places where we, people meet each other as equals. And the more that I thought about Central Park, I said, you know, anybody could have this meeting as equals in any city, and that was the idea of the Ciclovia. All of a sudden, the owners of the large corporations and their minimum wage workers and their families could meet each other as equals. 
They might not live in the same building. They might not go to the same restaurants. But there, some might have a $5,000 bike. Another might have a $50 bike. But they meet each other as equals. And that is powerful. And the term after I was commissioner, one of my brothers became mayor. And this was what they were, Japanese cooperation. You know, cooperation maybe it's because they wanted to sell more cars. <laughs> they were proposing elevated highways. Fortunately, he said no. You know, this is how the city was. Everybody was parking on the sidewalks. It was a huge fight because people tend to think, oh, it's easy somewhere else. Oh, New York is so easy. Oh, Paris is so easy. No, everywhere is hard. Change is hard. And just to get the cars out of the sidewalks, it was a huge fight. All of the retail started get, hiring people to get signatures to impeach the mayor. Actually, they got like 200,000 signatures. Fortunately, they needed like 400,000. <laughs> But it was tough. It was really hard. And look at these wonderful sidewalks, big, wide. By the way, why do we need wide sidewalks? Because that's where people live. I want to talk about the importance of sidewalks when, in, a, in a minute when I talk about complete streets. So keep in mind, BRT, you know, the bus rapid transit. When he started talking about bus rapid transit, people said, what? Like a subway, but it costs a fraction? This is what the public transit used to look like. From idea to implementation of the first line, 36 months. 36 months. And then they started building, taking out the houses on both sides, buying them or expropriating them so that we would have not just the transit, but also sidewalks and bikeways. Like that is the magic of your tram. The tram should have taken out more parking and maybe in order to have much wider sidewalks. You can still do it. You will never invest so much money in a street as when you do public transit. So when you're going to do the tram, do, do totally re, uh, reanimate all of that. And in many cases, you should have dedicated lanes for the tram. That's part of dem democracy. You know, I'm not going to talk about the Second Amendment because I know that is politically. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the first. The first says all people are equal. If all people are equal and you got 80 people on the tram, the tram should have the right of space to 80 cars with one person. So that's when people are going to get out of their car and take the tram because it's going to be faster and cheaper and more convenient. But if it's going to take you the same amount and you're going to go like a turtle behind cars, no, but if all of the sudden people in the cars are in traffic jams and they see that the people in the tram are going by really fast, then it's going to make a difference. So let's talk about, and also, people, how are people going to get to the tram or to buses? People are going to walk and bike. So we also need to have really good facilities for the bicycles, for the pedestrians, and also improve the public spaces along the road where it's going. So all of this is, is, is part of what needs to be connected. You know, sometimes you want to do protected bikeways, in Tucson and in other cities across America, people say, oh, we don't have the money. Well, Bogota is much poorer and did 175 miles in three years. 175 miles and went from a few thousand back into more than half a million. And always separating pedestrians and cyclists and making sure that they would get the important thing is connectivity because sometimes people do one. You know, yesterday I was working in Los Angeles, and I, I went by one that was 55 miles an hour road with four lanes. Sorry, I should have included it in the presentation. Four lanes and a painted line for bicycles. <laughs> and then you don't see anybody cycling. And then the people that don't want bicycles, they say, oh, you see, we don't have a bicycle culture. We are investing in, bi in cycling infrastructure, and people are not using it. Who's going to use it if the only thing between you and the cars going at 55 miles an hour is a painted line and four lanes of cars? <laughs> but some places where some of these bikeways were done were so poor that it's almost impossible for you to even imagine in Tucson. Look at the levels of poverty. And look at how this can be transformed with good sidewalks and good bikeways. By the way, when I say that it's not an issue of money, that doesn't mean that it's not an issue of priorities. Look at the plant, the trees, so that the microclimates and what there was not enough money for everything. So we need to we need to decide. Is it's gonna be walking and cycling or cars? 
And then my brother said, you know, someone else will do them for cars in the future. <laughs> Let's leave it for a future administration. So it's tough. And of course, the people that have cars were very upset. But, you know, change is not unanimous. We'll talk about change in a minute. But these were some of the ones that were done, and it's something really exciting. And it's also about being consistent. We need elected officials to be consistent between what they think, what they say, and what they do. And tonight, when I'm talking about people walking, I'm talking about anybody that moves at the speed of the pedestrian. But okay, enough about Bogota. I want to tell you about other things because now I run two organizations. I created a nonprofit called 880 Cities and also World Urban Parks. And usually I tweet about these topics. So also, if you have any comments or any ideas, you can tweet there. And I've been so fortunate to have worked in over 300 different cities. Two weeks ago, I worked in four cities in Israel. Last, last week, I was in Kansas City. Uh, tomorrow, I'm here for a couple of talks, and then I go to Phoenix, and next week in Florida, and the week after in Istanbul. But I learn so much in every city. And World Urban Parks is basically, we think everybody should have quality parks. And we got people from all over. This morning I was talking with the head of parks of Tucson to see if Tucson becomes member. We have an academy and we certify and there are conferences in Mexico next month and the World Conference is going to be in Melbourne. We do have advocacy committees so we learn from each other how to advocate for children, play and nature, for older adults, for knowledge, for large parks, for healthy parks, healthy cities. If you want to learn more about World Urban Parks, go to their website, worldurbanparks.org. But everywhere I go, people say, Gil, what's 880 cities? What's that 880 cities? Well, 880 cities is not really about walking or cycling or transit or parks or streets. Those are the means, not the end. The end is how can we help create successful cities? And, you know, I love to go. When I'm going to speak somewhere, I go and see the venue the night before. I came here last night to see, making sure that the computer was going to work. Otherwise, you would be upset. I was going to do a talk outdoors in Warsaw. So I went to the place and I see all of these people dancing. And I said, oh my God, how am I going to compete with these people dancing? And then I see the DJ, DJ Vika. <laughs> We're living longer. She's a magnificent entrepreneur. She is the owner of all the equipment. She's the organizer of the dances. Is also the DJ, then picks everything up and then goes to another city, to another park. So that's part of having vibrant cities. That's the kind of things that we should have all over downtown Tucson. So vibrant cities and healthy communities where people are going to be happier. And everywhere people say, Gil, is this intersection safe? Can my children walk to school? Can my grandparents walk to take public transit or ride their bike to get eggs or milk? Can they go on a bike to the park? Look, you don't need to be a transportation engineer. We call it the 880 rule of common sense. Unfortunately, common sense seems to be the least common of the senses. Three steps. Step number one, think of a child that you love, someone around eight years old. Can be your son, your daughter, your grandchild. I mean, these kids in the Cyclovia in Tucson. Once you have the child, then step number two, think of an 80-year-old that you love, your parents, your grandparents. And when you have the child and the older adult, it doesn't have to be eight and 80. This woman is 97, and she teaches yoga six days a week in New York. <laughs> Amazing. Then you go to step number three. Would you send them across that intersection? Would you send them walking to the park? Would you send them on the bike to go places? Would they feel safe? If you would, it's because it's safe enough. If you would not, it's because it's not, and we got to do it better. What if everything that we did in Tucson, everything, the sidewalk, the crosswalk, this theater, public transit, the schools, the libraries, everything had to be great for an 8 and an 80. Not a two eighties, eight and eighty as an indicator species. Because if it's good for the eight and it's good for the eighty, it's gonna be good for everybody from zero to over a hundred. We need to stop building cities as if everybody was thirty year old and athletic, <laughs> and build great cities for all. I guess you know what does it mean to build cities as if everybody was thirty year old. You know, today in the U.S. we have fifty thousand people over a hundred years old. Fifty thousand. By 2050, we're going to have 650,000. Our cities are not very nice for older adults. 
They're also not nice for children, so we got to work on that. So that is the concept of 880. And like Einstein said, we cannot solve the problems by using the same kind of thinking that we use when we create it. So I want to take you through eight messages. The first one is I want everybody here to become a guardian angel. A guardian angel of the gentle majority. The gentle majority are the children, the older adults, the poor. And when I say gentle, it's because they're not the squeaky wheel. We're doing public meetings, and the children are doing homework or are sleeping. The poor people have two and three jobs. They cannot go. But anything that you do in the city always think, how is this going to affect the children? How is this going to affect the older adults? For example, cycling. We don't want cycling for the 20 to 50 men in spandex. <laughs> for them too, but also for everybody else. So when we evaluate cities, we should evaluate how do we treat the most vulnerable people? The children, the older adults, the poor. Let me give you an example of each one. Children, here in Tucson, let's have playability everywhere. Let's make it a city that is fun and exciting. We come out on the sidewalk and we see swings. We're waiting for the tram and we see a small parquet. This is totally doable. This is how the bus stop could, be, could look like. It's not about money. This doesn't cost a lot of money. Nothing. It's just creativity. Let's allow people to do and to be creative and to have fun. And then people are going to say, good, that's nice in Tucson because the children, they like is fun and games. Of course, it's fun and games, but it's much more than that. Playing is how children learn. Playing is how children develop their muscle strength, their cognitive thinking, the capacity to concentrate, to learn languages. They develop a sense of belonging. They develop friendships. It's absolutely critical that children play everywhere, at home, at school, in the sidewalks, in the streets. We need urgently to have playability everywhere. So let's start doing it. What if we had a goal that in Tucson and everywhere, every kid should have a park or a play area within walking distance now in the next two, three, four years? So let's, whoever is not, let's start doing parks everywhere because it's totally doable. And also, let's not treat children as if every child was the same. We work with the Van Leer Foundation from uh, the Netherlands in a project that is called Urban 95. Urban 95 is what does a city look like from 95 centimeters that is the height of a healthy three-year-old. When you go out on the sidewalk, get on a knee and take a look. What, what does it look like? Like when you see cars parked, the idols we see above the car, but the children, they don't see anything. When you go to a playground, see, get on there. We have some sticks and we put some glasses and we do exercises and we go to places. We need to have cities that are nice for the children under five. We need to remember a little bit what does it mean. Because the children, they really want to be children. They behave differently sometimes. Oh, sorry, I don't have audio, but don't worry. You can imagine. It's just music. Can you raise a little bit the lights where the people are sitting without impacting the yeah, where people are sitting? Yeah, children behave differently, and we need to take care of them. We need to build fantastic cities for them. You know, the other day I was working at a city, and it could be Tucson, but it wasn't Tucson. It was another one, and I, w I went to see about 22 parks. And in the 22, in three of them, they had dog parks. And then I met with the mayor and his senior staff, and I said, Mayor, and I showed him some photos of the dog parks. I said, the dog parks are fantastic. The fence was the perfect height. They had benches. They had shade for the sun. Uh, they had the bags for the pool. They had everything. I said, you really know what makes dogs happy. <laughs> I said, but I went to 22 playgrounds in your city. And I did not see one park that was good for children under five. 
So you know much more what makes dogs happy than what makes children under five happy. So let's think about it. When we go to the parks in Tucson, what do we have for children? We, you know, we have known for over 40 years that the most important years of their life are the first five, when the brain is formed and all of this, uh, when the potential of the, of the human being is developed. Why is it that we don't do better with the children under five? You know, these kids, they're going to be the future engineers at the University of Arizona. <laughs> You know, so we got to have playability everywhere. You know, a city like New York, they did this. They, they thought every kid had a park within walking distance. They did a map, and they realized many did not. So they said, okay, what can we do? Let's see what belongs to us, the street, the sidewalk, the, the schools, the libraries. And then they went to the schools, and they said, look at this. This is horrible. This is what 90% of the schools in the U.S. call playgrounds, just a bunch of pavement. That's not a playground. So they said, we're going to do a playground. If and only if, we, call it a school, we make it a school park that after 4 p.m., Saturdays, Sundays, holidays, we open it to the community. And this is what they did. Look at all of those trees and green roofs and all kinds of games. By the way, why do they have so many green spaces? Because the children have a lot less attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder in green settings. But, you know, they didn't do one or two. They have done with TPL 221. They have increased by 25% the playgrounds of the city without buying one inch of land. We need to be much better at making everything that is public. Link. We don't need to link the streets and the sidewalks and the libraries and the schools and the parks and everything. Then the city says, oh, by the Board of Education, they are so stubborn. And then you go to the Board of Education and they say, oh, the city is so stubborn. No, both are stubborn. <laughs> and both are paid by the taxes of everybody. So we should force them to open up the schools after school and make, it, make it school parks. This could be really fantastic with all of these areas for, for, for gardening. You know, this school also is good for climate change. This can take up to 55,000 gallons of water if they get the 100 years rain. And you know, this is Copenhagen. All of these are schools. So it's used for the school from 7 to 4, and then it's used for the community after 4. And if there is not a school, then let's take over a street, and let's make it a play street. But every kid should have a park or a play area. So what is the role that all of us are going to play in this? We need to make it. And by the way, if each child is going to have a park or a play area within walking distance, of course, everybody's going to have one within walking distance. Older adults, you know, we're living longer. This is really, really exciting. So much longer. I call it the new 65. You know, in the history of humanity, the people that have ever lived to 65, half are alive today. Half. This is something that is very, very new. Look, in the U.S., 100 years ago, there were very few people over 65. Now it's so many more, and it's going to continue to grow. This is the population of the U.S., the ages today, and this is in 2050. It's going to grow across all ages, but mostly over 50. It's great. The population over 65 are going to double. The over 80 are going to quadruple. The over 100 are going to go from 50,000 to 650,000, and people are happy, and they are full of energy. They're not thinking about retirement. They're thinking it's about rehirement. They want to do things. We should create a movement, the 65 plus alive. And I say alive because we need to shake people up and say, hey, the people over 65 are alive. But live also because they want to live. I think the biggest waste of resource in America are the older adults. People retire and we cross them out as if they had died, except that they got 20, 30, 40 years left and they are healthier and wealthier and they have more knowledge and more experience. They could be fantastic assets to the community. They could be teaching English to the immigrants. They be, could be tutoring kids in the elementaries. They could be organizing activities for other older adults in the parks, Tai Chi and yoga and knitting. And the, the university, I'm going to university tomorrow. The university should be 25% of the courses should be for older adults. Older adults are hungry of knowledge. They want to learn about music and science and geography and history and all kinds of activities. It could be transformative. But somehow, most of the decision makers in the city think that the older adults are takers. And if the seniors go out, oh, we have a meeting with ARP. Oh, my God, what are they going to ask? They're not going to ask for anything. They want to help. They want to give back. It's not about takers. Maybe it's because we have a lot of subsidies for seniors, which is really dumb. Let's get rid of the subsidies for seniors. 
Why are we going to subsidize by age? Come on, it's 2018. We should be smarter than that. Why are we going to subsidize a 70-year-old millionaire just because he or she is 70? And we're not going to subsidize a 40-year-old single mom or dad in poverty just because he or she is 40. Yeah. Actually, this is a major success story of the U.S. Why do the senior subsidies came out? Because 50 years ago, the seniors were very poor. 50 years ago, the level of poverty in the U.S. was around 13, 14%. The level of seniors was 29, more than double. In only two generations, now the senior level of poverty is almost half the national average. So it went from being twice as much to being half. It's a major success. Also, when we subsidize, we have public transit and we give 20% to the seniors. The ones that don't need the money, that 20% doesn't make any difference. And the ones that cannot pay the transit, 20% is not enough. So instead of doing 20% to everyone, let's say, no, whoever can pay, no subsidy. To those who can pay, let's give them 90%. We need to be a lot smarter with that. So let's stop thinking that the seniors are takers. The seniors are givers. The seniors could be so wonderful in our communities. When I go to cities, the mayors keep telling me, oh, Gil, I have a, we have a problem. I say, yeah, what is the problem? Oh, we have too many old people. <laughs> I said, first, it's not a problem. Second, it's not you. It's everybody because we're living longer everywhere. If we had been born 200 years ago in the U.S., the life expectancy was 39. We more than doubled the life expectancy. We have learned how to survive. But when we have all of these issues of climate change and public health crisis and so on, we need to learn how to live. And I'm so happy that all of you are here because all of this is about together. How do, we're, we're trying to share and learning how how to live. And it's so exciting. And I'm, I'm truly so grateful when I speak to community in the evenings because you have so many options. You could be home reading a book. You could be at a restaurant having a beer. But the fact that you come as community together to share and learn and from each other and to say, how can we make our city better? No one is getting paid to be here. Uh, no one is, is going to get any individual benefit. Any benefit is going to be collective. So that's also about. So I really, I, I really thank you for being here because a lot of this is about the built environment. How are we going to do a built environment that is good for everybody? You know, sometimes we forget. We think when we say older adults, people say, oh, no, they are crippled. They cannot do anything. Even though the media keep telling us what do older adults look like. But I'm going to remind you what older adults look like. The older adults over 60, well... Christy, she, she's 65 now. In their 70s, in their 80s, in their 90s. Jimmy Carter was two weeks building homes in Canada last summer. And of course, we also have people on wheelchairs and with walkers, and that's fine. They can also be happy and productive, and they also can contribute, and we should also do a fantastic city for them. And also, like... For, for example, we should also work on multi-generational activities. I love this skateboard park, not only because it has a nice tree in the middle, but because it has a nice cozy area for parents and grandparents. Every time in Tucson that we do a park, a playground, a skateboard, let's do a cozy area for parents and grandparents. Imagine the magical bonding of the grandfather and grandkid going to the park. But if there is no place to sit and it's really hot outside or cold in, or rainy or what, in five minutes... Huh? There's no shade in the city. No shade. Yeah, they got to be shade. Not here because they don't, that's different. That's Copenhagen. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> but we need to have that bonding. Older adults are very lonely. You know, that's a huge issue. The two biggest issues of older adults are mobility and isolation. Isolation is so big that in the UK, two months ago, they created the Secretary of Loneliness. At the same level as the Secretary of State or Secretary of Foreign Affairs. It's a huge epidemic. Many people are committing suicide. You know, last month I donated a week of work in Puerto Rico. And I go there and I had a meeting with young people, like 10 to 16. And after I spoke, one kid raised his hand and he said, why are you promoting that we do parks in Puerto Rico when it's so difficult to make friends to go to the park with? And the room was silent. 
And I said, I want to thank you for having had the guts to say that in front of 300 people. I said, you are totally right. Many teenagers are committing suicide because of loneliness. So we really need to work on that. And for older adults having the nice cozy place where they can go and chat and socialize and have a coffee and read a book, it's so important. If we have that also connection of older adults, the grandparents and the grandchildren, it's kind of magical. Of course, we're going to need different things for older adults. For example, we need benches and we need walking paths. The other day I was working in Kentucky and I went with a mayor and we walked 10 blocks. And in 10 blocks, I didn't see any bench. And I said, Mayor, there are no benches. And he said, Gil, we took him out. The homeless. And I said, what, Mayor? You think this is magic? You take out a bench and a home appears? <laughs> I said... <laughs> I said, you are not only attempting against the homeless, also against the older adults. I said, older adults will not walk if there are not benches every block or every other block. And in addition of benches and walking paths, of course, we got to have game tables and restaurants, drinking fountains and so on. Walking is the number one activity by people of all ages. So every park in Tucson should have a walking path. We did a study of 750 parks in the U.S., the, number, the best cost-benefit facility of anything is the walking paths. But of course, not only walking paths, people also want to do gardening and reading and dancing and yoga and tai chi and bocce. It's the uses, it's the activities. Otherwise, people won't go. And I said children, older adults, and the poor. The poor, I'm talking about equity. I'm not talking about equality. Someone did a cartoon that explained this really easy. This is equality. No, we're not talking about that. This is equity. Some people are so far behind that some might not need a box. Might need, others might need two and three boxes. And someone said, this is equality, this is equity. Okay, this is reality. <laughs> but maybe all of you are smarter than that and are going to say, let's think outside the box. Maybe it's not just moving boxes around, but maybe we got to come with other solutions. Maybe taking down the wall. You know, the issue of equity has been really bad in the past. This is how we've been building cities. The U.S. is the wealthiest country in the world. And the wealthiest country has over 13 million children living in poverty. 13 million. These are the wealthiest countries in the world. The U.S. is almost the worst of the 35 wealthiest. One out of five children living in poverty. And then you say, oh, but what can we do? Well, can you do South Korea where they had the Olympic Games is one out of 16. Denmark is one out of 37. So maybe you should say, okay, in Tucson, it doesn't matter what the U.S., but here in our city, we're really going to bring it down. From the point of view of mobility, when people have a car, and here in some places, the city is growing so bad that it's going to be totally unsustainable. If you continue sprawling the city, you're not going to be viable financially, economically, environmentally, in public health. You're forcing people to have cars. When people have a car in the U.S., they're spending one out of four dollars on mobility. One out of four. People don't have money to go to the university or to re for retirement, and you go to their home and they got two and three cars. They will spend only five percent if they use public transit. That's why public transit is so important, and walking and cycling. There is nothing that the city government could do that would have a higher impact than allowing people to downsize from two cars to one, or from one to zero. And that would be fantastic for the local economy. You know, the American Automobile Association says that the cost of one car is $8,500. A small car, $8,500. You buy a car for $30,000. You sell it three years later for fifteen. dollars So just in depreciation, it was $5,000 per year, plus insurance, plus gas, plus so on. And this is going to be great for the community because if people have $8,500 this year and next and next and next, they are going to go to the restaurants and they're going to improve their gardens and they, it's going to stay in the local economy. The issue of equity, I worked in more than 50 cities in the U.S. I go to a city like Cleveland. I was visiting this neighborhood where the life expectancy is 64. Ten minutes away is 90. I don't know what is worse, that this happens... And it's not because it's Cleveland. You go to Washington and it's the same. You go to New Orleans and it's the same. I don't know what is worse, that this happens or that people are starting to assume this is normal. This is not normal. You go to this place and they say, oh, the people 55 is because they're lazy. It's because they drink too much beer. What? Even if you had the money and wanted to buy fruits and vegetables, there's not even one grocery store. Instead, there are four times as many convenience stores as in the other places. They don't have parks. The schools are horrible. In, in some cities, we got five times more parks in one part of the city than in another part. 
two. By the way, I'm going to be much faster with the other seven. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't run out. We got a great opportunity. Tomorrow I'm going to speak at the university and in the lifetime. Today we got 3.5 billion people living in cities in the world. We're going to go to 7 billion. And it could be very nice and civilized where people walk and bike and use public transit. In the lifetime of the students of the University of Arizona, we're going to grow. We're going to double the population in cities. In the U.S., we're going to go by more than 120 million people in the next 40 years. So that means we're going to have to do between 50 and 60 million homes. So if that is what's going to happen in the U.S. and in the world in the next 40 years, then let's analyze. What have we done in the last 40? Because if we go, we've been doing this good, let's just do more of the same. Well, in the last 40, these eight guys have more wealth than half of the world. Imagine the political power and the economic power. This is how we've been doing cities around the world. We've thought that housing was just an issue of supply and demand, and we have been sending the poorest people to the worst places where there are no transit and no sewage. And we've been focusing on car, 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 and not on people's happiness. And this is the kind of cities that we've been doing all over. It's a, and we haven't solved mobility. The more highways that we do, and the emerging countries like Russia and China and Brazil, they're doing exactly the same things. It's absolutely horrible as if they had not seen that it hasn't worked. This is all of Florence, Italy, and one highway intersection in Atlanta at the same scale. By the way, the cities, the cities are not responsible on the amount of people, on the, on the what, but yes, on the how. How are we going to grow? These are 10 different ways. Because people said, oh, in Tucson, people don't like density. Because usually people think density are 40-story buildings. These are 10 different ways of having exactly the same density. You can have the same density with five-story buildings next to each other than with a 40-story building every other block. So this is so much nicer, like Barcelona, to have five, six-story buildings next to each other. This is what we should have along here the tram. This is how we've been building cities. Is this what we're going to do in the next 40? Imagine if you are a child or an older adult or a person on a wheelchair, you are a slave to someone that drives a car just to go for an ice cream. So the last 40 years have really been pretty lousy. So what are we going to do in the next 40? We need to improve the cities that we have today and create great ones for many people. So it's time for change. And I know that change is hard. That's why we don't do change, because doing more of the same is easier. How do we make change? This is how we make change. This is how we make change. Whether you are for or against, unfortunately, citizens can no longer be spectators. People tend to think, oh, people in Denmark, they bike. is because those Vikings are so different. <laughs> That's why they bike. No, they were not biking. The cars were taking over in the 50s and 60s and 70s. But in the 70s, they had the energy crisis, the oil crisis. And when they had the oil crisis, they couldn't drive their cars on Saturdays or Sundays or both. So they started using bicycles. And they didn't have infrastructure. So in the Denmark and in the Netherlands, a lot of people were being killed. And in the Netherlands, they were doing these die-ins in front of City Hall every time that there was someone killed. And the newspaper were saying, you know, our children are being killed. And in Copenhagen, they were doing the same thing. So the first protected bikeway where the cyclists are separated from the, from the cars was in 1982. And then cycling took off in Copenhagen. That's why now they are so happy. So when you're going to make changes in Tucson, three recommendations. The first one, change is not unanimous. Sometimes elected officials say, oh, but there is some concern. There will always be concern. If you want change to be unanimous, you have to water it down so much. That is not going to be changed any longer. Second, the general interest must prevail over the particular. When you go to any meeting, say, the rule of the game is that everybody has to speak on behalf of the general interest. So when you say, are we going to widen the sidewalk and take out the parking? And people say, oh, but my business. They say, no, 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 don't tell me about your business. Give me the same argument, but frame it on the general interest. And the general interest must prevail over the particular. And third... When you say no to something, you also say yes to something else. It has consequences. So when you say, oh, we're not going to do parts, or we're not going to do bikeways, okay, that's fine. But then we're going to have more sprawl, more obesity, more bad quality of air, and so on. 
three, we got to do great parks and systems. I'm going to give you some symptoms so that when you go out tonight and you see some of the public places, because we really hear a lot when we listen and we see what we observe. One of symptom of good public places is if you find good places to sit. This guy needed five chairs to be happy. <laughs> his feet, his Big Mac. <laughs> sometimes people see monkey see, monkey does. No, sometimes people see and people do. <laughs> we do sidewalks and we don't put benches. Or we even put nails so that they won't sit. Or there are no benches on the sidewalks. This guy had to sit on his briefcase. His friend actually fainted. <laughs> and his wife is sitting on their baby. <laughs> But when you got nice places to see, it's kind of magical. All of the southern people in the middle of the winter, in the more people don't even sit facing each other, but facing others. It starts to rain and they won't even move. Another symptom is sociability. We see people talking to each other. It's a good symptom. Another is diversity, that we see children, we see youth, we see older adults. We see wheelchairs. Another symptom, affection. What affection are we feel at ease if we feel good? Another symptom, high proportion of women. Women are more selective. If it's not clean and safe, they're not going to go. But these are symptoms. What are some characteristics of parks? One is management. But in most cities, they think management is synonymous of maintenance. No, no, no. Maintenance is maybe 20% of management. Picking up the garbage, cutting the grass. No, management is how to get... Grandparents and grandchildren doing bread in the park. It's how to have uses and activities. Management is having people walking and cycling and playing chess and having lunch and taking a nap. Management is getting volunteers but giving them the tools. Management is organizing citizen meetings when you're going to do a change in the park to get their opinions before, during, and after. Management is getting resources, human, physical, financial. Management is having safety in the parks. But safety is not like I saw in London, England, this, beware of the thieves. <laughs> this is like an open invitation to the thieves of the city. Come here because this is a good market. <laughs> You know, you need a lot of police when the parks are empty. You don't need police when the parks are full of people. So think about it. The cheapest security for parks and public spaces are uses and activities. In most cities, it seems easier to find the millions to do the parks than to find the thousands to make it work. But we need those thousands to do the movie night, to do the knitting group, the walking group, to do it's those uses and activities. We've got to have access across the city. We've got to have activities in the summer, in the winter. So it's 52 weeks of the year, not just for the summer. So it's about that. You know, this is when I'm talking about walking paths. It doesn't have to be four miles. If you've got a big park, it can be four miles. But you've got a small one in front of the library, then you do one that is just a quarter of a mile, and you have different surface, and you count how many miles and kilometers each loop. It's about having painting and doing, you know, I was in Mumbai, and I said, what are these women doing? And they said, it's laughing yoga. So they said, get on the circle, and you get on the circle, and then you start laughing, and you get relaxed. You know, in Tucson, do you need small parks or large? Unfortunately, you need both because they satisfy different needs. We need a small neighborhood park because that is where we develop community. That's where we develop a sense of belonging. That is where we meet our neighbors. We also develop a sense of solidarity so it becomes safer. Because if something is happening, we go out and help. But if we don't know anybody, something is happening, we close the door. But we're not going to be able to play baseball or soccer, so we need medium-sized parks. And we're not going to be able to go canoeing, so we need big parks. So at the end of the day, we need all of it. We need the small, the medium, the large. We need active, we need passive, we need contemplative. We need a citywide system. Four, we also need sustainable mobility. Who came walking today? Anybody came walking? A few. Everybody else too. Everybody came walking. Every single trip begins and ends by walking. I don't see any cars in this room. We walk to the car. We walk to public transit. We walk to the bicycles. Everybody walks. That's how we were created. You know, just like the birds, they fly or the fish swims and the deer runs. People, we walk. We walk and we got to make it safe and enjoyable for everybody. The youth in South Africa or the older people. We walk in the summer. We walk in the winter. But we got to make it safe. And this isn't safe. Yesterday, people driving cars killed 741 people walking. 741. That's more than a person every two minutes. That's not civilized. They're not accidents. Accidents is when they could not be avoided. Most of them could be avoided. They're incidents. Now there is a Vision Zero network in the U.S. based on something that was developed in Sweden. 
He's saying people are not perfect. So let's build roads based on the fact that people are not perfect. And if we're going to improve walking, the pedestrians need to be a priority. And they're not a priority when we do sidewalks like this. <laughs> or when we allow the cars to park on the sidewalks. Or when we don't even do sidewalks and we're telling this woman, you are a second-class citizen. If we're going to improve walkability, we need to have 20 miles an hour in all the residential streets. All of them. You know, when you ask people, do you want the street in front of your house to be 20 miles an hour? People say, oh, yes. Do you want the street in front of everybody's home? Oh, no, everybody's home, no. You know, why 20 miles an hour? It's not because 20 is plenty sounds nice. And it sounds nice, but it's because people walk a lot more and it's good for health. People don't like walking when the cars are going by at 40, 50 miles an hour. They do like when they're at 20. Also, people even walk differently. When they're at 20, people also walk slow and they see a neighbor and they chat and someone is with the dog and they talk about the dog. And also because if you get hit by a car at 20 miles an hour, there is 5% probability of being killed. At 40, it's more than 80%. And there are many, many studies that show exactly the same thing. That's why Seattle, what does Seattle have that Tucson doesn't? For now, they got 2,400 miles of residential street at 20 miles an hour. Last year, they approved 2,400 miles at 20. Why? Because they, they, they want to make it safe for everybody. So we should do it in Tucson as well. I mean, we put in front of the schools 20 miles an hour. Why? Because it works. But do we want children to be safe only in front of the school? We, these are not technical issues. We know that if we put a small island, we eliminate in the crosswalk, we eliminate more than half of the incidents. Why are we doing crosswalk without an island? When we know that the kids go, they don't want to go in one light, then they have to stop. All their adults are being killed three times as many as the proportion of the population. And when we talk about sustainable mobility, it's not only walking, it's riding bicycles, using public transit, new uses of cars. I'm not saying that this is the end of the car industry, but the way we use cars is changing very, very fast. So we got to think of what is the new uses. For example, older adults are terrified of losing their driver's license. Their impact is as much as if they are told that they are being diagnosed with cancer. It's not because they love cars, it's because they love mobility. All their adults want to age in place and continue visiting their friends and shopping in the same places. And now people say, oh, the autonomous vehicles, the driverless cars. You know, when you're in a traffic jam, <laughs> it's not the driver, the one making the jam. <laughs> it's the cars. So whether these have a driver or they don't have a driver, it doesn't really matter. So if we don't change our habits, this is how cities look without driverless cars, and this is how they're going to look with driverless cars. <laughs> There's not going to be any change. Maybe less parking because people are going to share more cars, but we're going to have a lot more trips. You don't even need a driver's license. You can be 5, 10, 20, 100. You might even have people less cars, so there's going to be a lot more congestion. Also more sprawl because people say, oh, if I'm not driving, I don't care if I live 10 minutes further. So we need to decide how are we going to regulate technology. Technology has to work for people, not people for technology. That makes a big difference. So it can be heaven or hell. It's up to us. Riding bicycles. This could be too soon. Fantastic. Why not? It's totally dual. By the way, I want to remind you of something. You need to benchmark with good cities. If Tucson, if you want to compare with cities, if you want to find cities that are worse than you, in five minutes you can do a list of a thousand cities. But if you compare yourself with cities that are worse, eventually you're going to look like those. No, you're going to say, which cities of similar size and income level, which has the best cycling, which has the best quality of air, which one has the level, best level of happiness? of public health, of mental, of physical, and so on. And of course, you are doing things. This morning, I told some of the decision makers, I said, you are doing, but in many cases, at the speed of the turtle. So what happens? You say, oh, I might be slow, but I'm ahead of you. No, benchmark with the best. Benchmark with Copenhagen. What does Copenhagen? You got to be as good as them. If you want to promote cycling, you can be like Copenhagen. Except that there, it rains all year round. It's horrible. <laughs> but... 
41 out of 100 trips are done on bicycles. In the downtown, it's 61%. But citywide, is 41. And they're not saying 41 is enough. They want to go to 50%. And men don't need shirts in the summer. And women don't need, don't need special shoes. And then now they're having public bikes with the GPS. And all. But you need the public bikes is once you have the infrastructure. People are worried about the bikes. Oh, let's have bikes here. No, it's not the bikes. You know, bikes are very inexpensive. You go to a garage sale and you buy one for $20. So bicycle is not the issue. The issue is where to ride them. That's what you need a grid. That's why, and they continue to improve and do more. At one level is for cycling, at another is for pedestrian, and lower is for cars. Some of these, the ones that have this, all the traffic lights are the speed of the cyclist. This bridge was done in the last three years. This, when I took this photo at, at 10 a.m. or 11, 16,000 cyclists had gone by with all of this snow and cold and so on. And it's people of all ages and all conditions. That's what we need here in Tucson. If we're going to prove bikeability, it's not about charros. You, know, you have a lot of these. You have charros, like these ones. <laughs> And you have, you, you have the, the park cars, you have the, you, you're forcing the cyclist to protect the park cars. Whoops, what happened here? The cyclist protecting the car, park cars. Instead of moving the, car, the park cars and having them protect the cyclist. It's simple as that. You move the park cars and then you put the cyclist. It's not about signage, it's not about parking, it's not about lockers or maps or teaching, it's not about racks on the buses. It's not about just painted lines. You know, this is like getting the saddle before the horse. <laughs> Think of someone that doesn't bike in Tucson because they are afraid. It can be you, your spouse, your parents, your children. Would that person start biking if you do bicycle parking or if you do maps or if you do um, racks on the buses? No. The only two ways to, it might make it nicer for the 1% that are cycling, it might make it nicer, but it won't get more cyclists. To get more cyclists is simple, two things. First, we need to lower the speed where people live. So residential street at 20 miles or less. And we need to create a grid of protected bikeways. So everything I said about walking at 20 miles is the same thing for cycling. But we need to create a network of AAA bikeways. What is AAA? All ages and all abilities. It's for everybody. We've got to think of daytime and nighttime and rain and summer and winter and thinking of anybody. And if you got the money and the political decision, make it permanent. If you don't, make it temporary. But don't just paint. Sometimes we paint a line. We do what is really hard is to get the politicians to give the space. And then we paint a line. And we don't do what's easy. Enhance that painted line by just putting some plastic bollards. And it's going to make a huge, a world of difference. If you have the plastic bollards, we need to create a network because nothing as important as connectivity. If you don't buy because you are afraid and now 20% of the ride is safe, but 80% is still in the middle of the cars, you are not going to bike. So it has to be city-wide, like the power grid, like the water grid, bicycle grid. And the, and the quality of the infrastructure is a symptom of the respect that we have for people. We got to improve public transit. My brother that became mayor again two years ago, he said that the civilized city is not the one where the poor have cars. It's the one where the rich use public transit. <laughs> we need to create public transit that is good for everybody. So also, something else that he does, which I recommend for Tucson, one day a year, there is no private cars. None. Zero. Imagine a city of 8 million people, zero cars. Imagine if in Tucson for one day. Then it gets people thinking, what, does, what is the role of the car? And you can have kids in elementary schools doing drawings. What, that, what does a city look like without cars? Kids in, in secondary, in high school, and in universities can do research. What is the role of the cars? Also, we, you could have the senior people in the city, mayor, councillors, and decision makers, one week of the year, no private car. They can take transit or walk or bike, and then they can see how good or bad it is. Not just one day, because then they postpone all meetings for the following day. One week. <laughs> so we got to have public transit everywhere. Sometimes it can be buses. Sometimes it can be LRTs. So there can be many options. I know you don't have this horrible weather, but the analogy, think of this, but thinking of the, of the hot weather. 
Someone said everybody's going to get out of their car. I said, you think people are going to get out of their car when this is what the bus stop looks like? This is a high school for 1,500 students. So I decided to show that mayor another bus stop. <laughs> and he said, Gil, why are you showing me this? I said, maybe that's what the bus stop would look like if the decision makers use the bus service. <laughs> you know, people keep saying, Gil, we need infrastructure for public transit. Infrastructure? Look at Tucson from the air. 35% of the city are roads, are streets. Already 35. You want it 45? You want it 55, 60? How much do you want? So let's think of the mobility math. We got to start thinking. Do we want one of these or 140 of those? One of those or 145? I mean, we just need to make a decision. How is it? How are we going to sp split the space that belongs to all of us? And now you are talking about complete streets. So complete streets is not just a check mark. Okay, walk, bike, transit, cars, checked. No, not really. There are some streets where you're not going to have people walking or cycling. Others where you're not going to have cars. Or, you know. So also some people are talking about shared streets. And some people are coming with some cute idea to say, oh, let's mix everybody. Let's take out all of the signs. Let's have people negotiating. And then people are really going to slow down. I don't really want this guy negotiating anything <laughs> or this little girl. And even if we do, we need to have the most vulnerable. Also, in complete streets, we also got to think of children and all the adults and poor. We also got to think of democracy. We cannot have 80 people on public transit at the speed of the cars, of one person on the cars. It's also about flexibility so that the complete streets can have different uses. On Sundays, it can be for cyclovia. We also have walking. It's more than walking. Walking is not just to go to point A to point B. Walking is where we meet friends. We make boyfriends and girlfriends. And we, so we need trees and benches. And we need at the front level, at the street level, we need retail. We need sidewalks. Sidewalk is the most important infrastructure of, in, of any in the city are the sidewalks. Actually, the sidewalks should not even be run by the streets. The sidewalks are more a cousin, a family member of the parks than of the streets. Because there we go and we sit and we watch people and we do other things. So sidewalks are absolutely great. We also ride bicycles. But riding bicycles, we need to have where to ride it. And we also got to use public transit. And in public transit, we got to have frequency, connectivity. You know, the other day, a mayor, the mayor of Malmo, Sweden, told me, Gil, you know, people didn't like the buses. So you know what he did with his buses? He put a nose on the bus, he covered the wheels, and now they look like trains. <laughs> Part of it is marketing. Part of it is how to dignify the use. You know, just a couple of images that is not, is not a lot of dignity when, my God, that, you, you don't really want to ride that bus. <laughs> or even this one might be, might be sushi, but... You, know, it's, you gotta tell people it, part of it is dignity sell the advertising but don't sell the windows even it's bad for safety you, at night you don't see what's going on inside we need to dignify you know? it's about complicity, it's about equity it's about integrating, not segregating it's about the, also the, keeping the public in public areas so it's not just about a check mark so complete streets really make sure that they are truly complete. Six, everybody learns from everybody. I know some of you, and oh my God, sorry. I'm going to wrap up in 10 minutes uh, because there are two more. <laughs> sorry. Uh, in Tucson, you're going to think you're different. you got nothing in common with Copenhagen or Bogota. I know in Tucson you're saying, oh, Gil, we are unique. <laughs> I know, like Margaret Mead said, always remember that you are absolutely unique, just like everyone else. <laughs> This is not like on the computers that we copy and paste. No, it's all about adapting and improving. Even within Tucson, each neighborhood is different, each street is different, each corner. But it's not adapting, it's not about copying, but everything that I'm saying, you can adapt and you can improve. Let me show you a city like Melbourne. Melbourne has the same, almost the same weather that you have in Tucson. Very hot, in the summer especially. 30 years ago, it would not have been one of the top 300 cities in the world. Even they made fun of themselves, an empty, useless city center. This is a really good example for Tucson. 
similar in size, the population, half a million people and so on. They're putting public art all over the place. But not art for cars at the 60 miles an hour, but for people at three miles an hour. They are planting trees everywhere. Look at the streets without any trees and the same street with trees. It's totally transformative. It's something that is really exciting. The trees are good for health and for business and for the environment. Also, they're investing in public places. And they're investing in public transit. And it's exciting, some of the things that they are doing. For example, they had all of these laneways that were dark and horrible. And then the city said, why don't you set up a business? Set up a restaurant, a flower shop. And then the city is giving them seed money. So like here in the downtown, many people don't want to come. So the city says, I'll give you $50,000. Because I know that it's easier to do that same business or the art or whatever you want to do in a more established way. So the city is helping them out in some ways because it's going to be a win-win. Everything that you put in the public space, make sure that it's good. Whether it is someone's shoe shining or selling flowers, look at this. Beautiful street furniture. I said, you make a lot of money? They said, no, it's not about the money. More than money. We could rent this for $1,000 a month. Instead, we said, no, we're going to rent it only for 100 But you got to keep all of this area clean. If you see anyone doing anything bad, drugs or selling stolen merch, you got to call the police. Don't get involved, but, but the most important, the time. You gotta open Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at 7 a.m. and close at 8 p.m. Or later, no earlier than 8 p.m. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, 24 hours. So what, what do they say? They said, you know, they're not gonna sell a lot of flowers at 3 a.m., but people are gonna feel safe because they're walking and they know that this block there is a flower shop, the next one is a fruit shop, the next one something else. So when you are thinking of the public space here in downtown to something, this is at noon, this is like at 7 p.m., this is at midnight, and people feel safe. So it's also about, also this person, you dignify the person. He says, oh, I'm good. I'm using the space that belongs to everybody. It's not that the public space doesn't belong to anybody. Just the opposite. It belongs to everybody. So it has to be almost sacred. They used to have a river going right through the middle of Melbourne. And they took down, they were all factories next to the river. They took down the factories and created a beautiful linear park. And they're doing all of these wonderful pedestrian bridges. And it totally revitalized the city. No one wanted to live downtown. And look now, everybody wants to live downtown. They don't need a car. They got lots of activities. And some people are telling me, Gil, but what do we do outside of the center of Tucson? First, don't let the city grow anymore. Whether you need to go to the state or whatever, it's horrible. You won't be able, you, you are doomed for life if you continue sprawling. But look, look this idea. This is very similar. This is something that you could do here. Unfortunately, I didn't show it this morning because I, I, I didn't know that, that was a big issue. But, okay, you can have the downtown in one place, and then any place where you're going to do either a bus rapid transit or a light rail or the, the streetcars, what are they doing? They're telling people, look, here where people live is like the suburbs of Tucson. If you live here, you are a slave to the car. There is no place to even shop. There is no place to even get an ice cream. Nothing. You got to get on a car to go everywhere. So they are saying, okay, we're going to put public transit here and here. So we're going to densify, but only we're going to put all of these houses, they're going to stay the same. So the people that are horrified of the density, don't worry. All of you are going to have the house except that now if you live here, you're going to have public transit within walking distance. Also, within walking distance, you're going to have restaurants and coffee shops and bookstores and grocery stores and convenience and all kinds of things. So this is some of the things they're doing. I mean, what, 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 what's so nice about this? So they're telling people that are doing renderings and say, for example, the buildings cannot be wider, I mean, taller than the width of the road. At the street level, it has to be retail at the street level and housing from the second level up. And this is totally dual. When I was looking today at, at the street here where you got the street car, I mean, almost everything is one or two stories. It would be so magnificent if it was five or six. And, and then it would totally revitalize. If you are going to grow by around 25% the population of the greater Tucson in the next 30 years. It would be so magnificent if all of the 25 was in the downtown. You would have one of the most vibrant and exciting downtowns in America. I mean, why, why, why do you want to save this when this could be six stories? There is nothing to save there. You're already doing some, but you got to do much more like that. 
this was so exciting, a building that was kind of okay. You do all of this in front and you get all of this retail and it becomes vibrant and exciting. So this could be, the, 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 the transit corridor has to be really magnificent. Be changed. Just a couple of images from Rotterdam. Look, they, got, they were also suffocated by cars. This is in the last five years. They took away the cars on one side. Look, you want to live here or you want to live here? Is that clear? Is the kind of changes that, that they are doing. This is the, the difference between having cities for people or cities for cars. That's where they got their tram, their street cars, and, and put in the green. The New York effect. The New York, I love New York not only because I ran my first marathon there, <laughs> but because these two women are transforming New York. They were on the Bloomberg, Janet Sarikan and Amanda Burden, magnificent. They had places like, like Broadway. They had the bike lanes. Who uses bike lanes painted? The cars and the kamikazes. <laughs> then they started doing physically separated, and then people started using them. It's about that. It's totally doable everywhere. You can do this. Again, it's not about copying, but you can adapt and improve. Look, bringing out, taking out spaces, and making improving. Look at this crosswalk. You have so much better weather than New York. Your crosswalk would be so much nicer. They had a lot of, all of these pocket parks. Not one or two. Over 120 pocket parks. They turned this into this. You know, the nice thing about all of these pilots, initially you do it only for two years. So you go and say, okay, cars, move out. We're going to do a small park. It's a pilot project only for two years. And then the car owner say, oh, this woman is crazy. But let her do it because it's only for two years. And then Janet goes in with the paint and the umbrellas. And two years later, she takes out the paint and puts real grass. <laughs> so it's... Be bold. If you had told anyone 10 years ago that Times Square was going to be pedestrian, they would have thought you were crazy. Well, they made it pedestrian. So this is completely doable. So these are the kind of changes that can happen. It's, who would have thought that people were going to do in yoga and tai chi and things on, at Times Square? And then these things change. You, some of you might know who Shania Twain is. <clears throat> well, Shania Twain is from Timmins, 43,000 people. The mayor of Timmins called me and said, Gil, I said, 10 minutes, so it's like five left. Uh, she said, Gil, uh, you got to come and see this park. And I said, I'll go, but why? She said, because two years ago you came by and you were talking about uh, pilot projects in New York. She could have said, oh, my city is 43,000. I got nothing to do in New York. I'm just going to text. No, she paid attention. And she liked the idea of pilot. And she went back to Timmins, brought out the, the, the plants and the chairs and the table and created a park. So that's the idea. Let's open up everything that we're talking about is totally doable. They, Buenos Aires, they went to New York. They saw what they were doing. He's the Minister of Transportation. She's the Director of Human Mobility. They don't call it active transportation. They call it human mobility. And all of these streets, there were four cars five years ago. Now all of them are pedestrians. Look at this. Cars park and cars moving, and now they're pedestrian. They leave this so that the cars can come between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. if they want to do deliveries in the stores. So all of this is totally dual. I mean, in Buenos Aires does it. Why not Tucson? It's a, so, and, and again, it's not about copying, but take a look at what works, what doesn't work, and implement it. And this pilot project is nice because then you do it. You can do it overnight. People go home on Friday. They come back on Monday, and then it's done. And then they might get upset for one or two days. <laughs> they were so proud that they had 16 lanes. Well, they took out six, and now they're more proud because they have a bus rapid transit. And the mayor of Buenos Aires was elected president of Argentina last year. So let's focus on the benefits. This is not about the living streets. This is it's because living streets has so many benefits. Improve the culture, the festivals, the activities, the ethnicity. Improve the education, getting the schools into the public places, the recreation, the environment. Have different benefits because each decision maker has a different benefit. Let me give you an example on, on health. Is this what the future looks like? <laughs> we have a huge problem of obesity in the U.S., we have problems, obesity, heart attacks, and respiratory problems, and anxiety, and stress. More than one out of three people in the U.S. are obese. These are the 35 wealthiest countries in the world, and the U.S. is last. Does it make sense? 
And if we don't do something about it, it's going to go to 44%. And when people say, it's always been like this, it has not always been like this. 20 years ago, there was not one state that had over 20%. Today, there's not one state that has less than 20%. So we got to work in many areas on this, having better school lunches. we got to have farmers markets in all of the neighborhoods. we got to have gardens in the schools. I saw that, too. I heard that just now that one of the elementary schools is having gardens. we got to have in the schools, in the parks, in the streets, everywhere. And we got to be active. Just walking and cycling as a normal part of everyday life. This is kind of like the magic drug. It's good for strokes, for cancer, for osteoporosis, for high blood pressure. And it's not about doing marathons. It's only 30 minutes a day for adults, 60 minutes a day for children. And nothing, no, no better way to do it. Actually, no better way. No, no other way to do it than walking and cycling as a normal part of everyday life. There is no city in the world, none, that have, has more than 50% of the people active that is not walking or cycling. It's nice to organize soccer or baseball or what, but people do it twice a week. People do, don't do it five days a week. Uh, or people don't go to the gym five days a week. A few, a tiny minority, but massive, it has to be walking and cycling. And all of this is gonna be fantastic for physical health. And it's good because more than one out of 10 people have diabetes. I work in some communities in Texas where it's more than 30%. But also, one out of 10 have depression. So there is no health without mental health. Depression today is the leading cause of disability. We really got to work. If we have contact with nature, it's going to improve our mood, our cognitive attention. We need to have nature everywhere, in our homes, in our streets, in our schools, in our parks, everywhere. If our neighborhood is green, it's going to lower the depression, the anxiety, the stress. So it's not just because it looks nice. It's because it's going to be good for our health. And last, the community. Let's listen to the community. The community is the expert. If we're going to do this park, let's not just do yoga and yoga and yoga everywhere. No, some people want to have a fire pit. Some people want to have a pizza oven. Others people want to do exercise. There are all kinds of things. The children. Let's honestly listen. Sometimes we work with children and we ask them, how, how do a drawing? How do you want this neighborhood? How do you want your community to be when you have your parents' age and you have children of your age and they start doing drawings and it's exciting? And engage the children, not because they're the future. It's because if we educate the children, like Jamie Lerner from Curitiba says, if we educate the children very, very well, they go home, and then they educate their parents. Look at this kid. He's only 13, and he drew, he wrote, I want few cars, more people walking, more people cycling. And then he didn't write, but he drew an area for pedestrians, for cyclists, for buses, and for cars. He doesn't know that we walk at three miles an hour, but he knows that if we mix pedestrians and cyclists, the pedestrian is injured. We don't want any cyclists on the sidewalks. Sidewalk is to walk. Sidewalk. We don't want mixing cyclists with cars because then the cyclist is going to get injured. And then he drew public parks and low buildings with street-level activity. Actually, my message tomorrow at the University of Arizona to the urban planning students, I said, guys, study very, very hard because now the 13-year-olds can summarize urban planning 101 in one drawing. So I want to end by saying, how do we want to live? That's the key. And one kid in, in the Cyclovia in Tucson had a really good idea. Don't be blue, be happy. It's about being happy. You know, happiness is one of the most difficult words to define, almost impossible to measure, but it's a reason to live. In many ways, that happens with most important things in our life, love, affection. So we need to think outside the box. These issues are not technical. They are not financial. They are political with a big P. Everybody needs to participate. We need to create alliances. We, it has, it's like a three-legged stool. One of the legs are elected officials. Hopefully elected officials that want to do as elected and not just be. We need public sector staff, but not just planners. We got to get public health, environment, education, economic development. And we got to get the community, the activists, the media, the university, all of you. How do we get all these three legs together? What is the glue? Well, the glue is the sense of urgency. We got to do it now. And when we have the sense of urgency, then you need a, a shared vision of how do you want Tucson to be. And then the action. Some cities have the vision, but they have no action. So they know what needs to be done, but they don't do it. So they become frustrated. Other cities have action, but no vision. They do a little here, a little here. They are always doing things, but it's like a Frankenstein. It's total chaos. But if you have vision and you have action, 
You're going to transform too soon. You're going to create living streets, creating cities for all. And we're going to be able to move from talking to doing. And I know that you are doing, but you're going to do more and you're going to do it faster because it's about creating a too soon that is vibrant with healthy communities where all people are going to live happier. So let's do it now. Thank you. So we hope that you will join us in making this happen tomorrow, right? Like, let's not wait. We can do this now for our community. I'm not going to talk long, guys. Don't worry. <laughs> um, oh, but, and, but, but I haven't finished. Oh. Got last, last message. 20 seconds. There is not going to be a Martian coming down oh. to fix our city. It's up to all of us, working together. There is absolutely no excuse. Everybody, no elected officials, city staff, the community. So it's so fantastic. It's going to be so exciting, the, the transformation that can and should take place. So, it's a, you know, she had an idea. She had a dream one day of creating living streets, and she created it in 2011. Yeah. And then one day she said, let's do the Ciclavi, and then... It's done, and then, so everyone, it's about everybody working together and helping each other, and all of this is, is not about just sitting down and waiting for the Martian to come down. <laughs> it's, not, it's not coming down. On that note, I hope you will join us this Sunday at Ciclo Via Tucson, and then I invite you, we passed out these programs to find out more about our Complete Streets Initiative, where we're gonna try and get our decision makers to stand up and start transforming our streets immediately, because there are so many things we can do. And then I encourage you to learn more about Living Streets Alliance and get involved. We have so many needs, so many ways to take advantage of your time, no matter what age you are, and plug you in, and, and let's, let's do this. Thank you all for being here tonight. And one more round of applause for Gil, because, yeah. <laughs>